All right, you crazy kids. Here's your lecture on matter and energy. So what I've done in this lecture is highlighted things in green and yellow. Everything in green is kind of like the topic that we're gonna be working with, and anything in yellow is a vocab word that you should know. Now, these vocab words, I don't expect you to memorize the definition. You'll never see a test question that says define matter, define energy. However, the words matter and energy will be in a test question. So to understand that question, you have to understand what matter and energy are all about. A lot of these vocab words in this lesson you've heard before, but I'm going through them just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So, chemistry, the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter and the changes it undergoes. First half of the year in chem, we talk about the composition, structure, and properties. The second half of the year, we talk about matter and how it changes. So, that's what we're doing. Matter, energy, mass, volume, density. Like I said, you've seen these words before. We want to make sure we know what we're talking about. Matter, anything that has mass and occupies space. Energy, the ability to do work. In chemistry, we talk about energy being released as exothermic and energy absorbed being endothermic. Whenever matter changes, you always have a change in energy. Whether it's chemical or physical, it does not matter. There's always a change in energy. Mass, the measure amount of matter present. Volume, a measure of three-dimensional space. And then density, a ratio of mass to volume. This formula is in your packet. It's on the very back page. You will have that packet for all of your tests and all of your quizzes. It is a reference packet for your use. For this formula, it is a three-variable formula. I'd expect you guys to be able to manipulate that formula, formula to solve for any of those variables. So I could give you the density and volume of something, and you'd have to solve for its mass. The building blocks of matter. When we look at the matter around us, it's made up of these things. The smallest building block, we call an atom. An atom, yeah, you're going to say, oh, there's smaller things than atoms. Yeah, you have protons, neutrons, electrons, you have quarks. You, it keeps on going smaller and smaller and smaller. True, but we're talking about the things that maintain the properties of elements. So the smallest piece of an element we call an atom. We can't get any smaller than that because it's no longer that element. Because it won't have the same properties of that element. So the smallest building block in this class, we're going to call the atom. If I have a whole bunch of atoms together, they're all only on one kind of atom, we call that an element. And then if I have two or more elements that are chemically bonded together, we call that a compound. Properties and changes in matter. So we have physical and chemical properties. We also have physical and chemical changes. A physical property and a chemical a physical change are somewhat similar. You'll see the overlap as we go through them. So a physical property, a characteristic that can be observed without changing the identity. If I put something on a balance and get its mass, that something does not change. I can take a rock or a block of iron and put it on a balance. It's still a rock or still a block of iron. By measuring its mass, it doesn't change its identity. So we call that a physical property. A physical change is somewhere, somewhat similar. Ooh, I can almost talk. Uh, I'm changing the substance, but it does not change the identity. So if I cut a block of iron in half, it's still iron. It doesn't change the identity. We call that a physical change. A chemical property, chemical change. Now we're talking about actually changing the identity of the substance. So when I burn wood, it's no longer wood. It's changed to something else. The ability to burn, or it can combust, we call that a chemical property because it changes the substance as you test that property. A chemical change is when you're showing that and converting it to different substances. We show chemical changes with chemical reactions. Here's a chemical reaction. I have some carbon and oxygen, and I'm combining them together to carbon dioxide. On the left side of my equation, I have my reactants, and they change into your products. Right in the middle, we have this thing called a yield sign. That's what separates your reactants from your products. Notice that I'm not changing the identity of those atoms. I'm simply combining them or rearranging them. If I were to change the identity, now we're talking about a nuclear change. There are two types of nuclear changes. You have when atoms are split apart, such as this uranium splitting to barium and krypton, and when atoms are combined together. So I can take two hydrogen atoms and combine them into helium. Um, fission and fusion is what we're talking about there. Indications of chemical reactions. I want you guys to be able to look at something and decide whether or not it's a physical or chemical change. So if I look at water boiling, I can say to myself, like, oh, that's just water changing state. It's going from the liquid state to gaseous state. That's not a chemical reaction. You might look at number two and say, oh, but that's forming a gas. But remember, it's not changing the identity of water. It's just in the gaseous state. What I mean by that is these are indications of chemical reactions, but they're not foolproof. So I might see one of these, but I have to be a little careful to make sure that it is an indication of a chemical, of a chemical reaction and not just 
uh, an anomaly, and it's still a physical change. So indications of chemical reactions, there are four of them that I'd like you to know. Light and heat, such as fire. Formation of a gas, if I were to throw some lithium in water, I would have some hydrogen gas produced. A precipitate, when mixed, two different liquids produce a solid. That solid, by definition, is a precipitate. I will show you a video of that. And a color change. So if I have something that's blue and it changes to green, most likely a chemical change occurred. We have four states of matter, and I want you guys to know a little bit about them. We have solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Plasma, we're going to spend very little time on, so don't worry about plasma too much. Uh, it's a very high energy state. Atoms lose electrons. It's weird. Lightning's an example. Um, so don't worry too much about plasma. But solid, liquid, and gas, I want you guys to have a good sense of what those things really are. So for solid, we have a definite shape and a definite volume. Notice how I have these little atoms here, and they have their own shape, and they have their own volume. They're vibrating, but they're not sliding really past each other. If I change to the liquid state, I have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. Indefinite shape means the atoms can slide past each other, so this atom right here could go wherever it wanted to. And then finally, a gas, an indefinite volume, and an indefinite shape. These don't have a shape. They're all separated individual atoms, and they could even leave the container, meaning they have an infinite volume. We're going to classify matter. So if I were to look at matter, I should be able to pick out whether I'm dealing with a mixture or a pure substance. We're going to deal with mixtures first. So a mixture is a blend of two or more types of matter, each which retains its own identity and property. So if I were to look at maybe some trail mix, and I have some peanuts, and I have some raisins, those peanuts and raisins are not chemically combined together. That would be a mixture because they still retain their own identity and properties. Whoa, properties. There are two types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. That idea of trail mix would definitely be a heterogeneous one, just as a heads up. And how you can tell the difference is the definitions of those. A homogeneous mixture is the same throughout, and a heterogeneous mixture is different throughout. If I were to examine a sample of something that's homogeneous, like salt water, and I were to take a sample here and a sample here, those would have the same exact composition and proportions. So the salt water at the top left is the same as the salt water on the bottom right. There's no difference. Salt and water are not chemically combined. They are simply mixed together. For heterogeneous, that would be like sandy water. The sand and the water is not chemically combined, so it fits the definition of mixture. But if I took a sample up top here and a sample down bottom here, the bottom sample, I would have a lot of water and sand, and the top sample, I would have only water. So the fact that they are different makes that a heterogeneous mixture. The other half of how to classify matter are called pure substances. So if it's not a mixture, it's going to be a pure substance. Things that have a fixed composition are pure substances. There are two types of them, elements and compounds. Here we have an example of a compound, H2O. This is a nice little drawing of what water looks like. I would expect you guys to be able to draw water at the blink of an eye. Um, we have two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. That's how they fit together. If you look at it, it might look like Mickey Mouse. I prefer that you think of water as a dead frog. Because in reality, water is a polar molecule. Those hydrogen atoms have a positive charge, and the overall oxygen atom has a negative charge. That gives you a little bit more information. We'll talk about that later this year. Here's a little concept map on how to classify matter. So here we have matter at the top. Our first separation could be pure substances and mixtures. We just define those. If it's a pure substance, those are either elements or compounds. We have defined those as well. And then elements and compounds are made up of atoms. We've defined that as well. On the other side, we have mixtures. And mixtures can either be homogeneous or heterogeneous. And it's also important to note that these are also made up of atoms. Cool. A couple definitions for you before we end this lecture. Kinetic energy and temperature. You've probably heard of kinetic energy, energy of motion. You've heard of temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy in a sample. So whenever I say the words kinetic energy, I'm talking about energy of motion, how the atoms are moving. We measure that by taking its temperature. A thermometer measures kinetic energy. Kind of a neat thing. So here we have a question for you. Which of these has more kinetic energy? We have some iron in the liquid state, copper in the solid state, and krypton in the gaseous state. Can you answer this question? No, you cannot. Why can't you? Because you don't have its temperature. Oh, now I can answer this question. 
All right, so glancing at this, if I'm looking at kinetic energy, realize that kinetic energy, well, how to measure kinetic energy is temperature. So that means that even though this is your solid state, your correct answer is B, that has the highest temperature. All right, what determines if an object will sink or float? Mass, weight, or density? Hopefully you guys realize it's density. If its density is greater than the substance you're putting it in, it will sink. If it is less than the substance you're putting it in, it will float. I need you guys to know the density of water. It is 1.0 gram per centimeter cubed. Remember that centimeters cubed and milliliters are equivalent to each other, so I could have used 1.0 gram per milliliter. And that's the same thing as 1.0 gram per centimeters cubed. If the density of something is less than that, it would float if it's in water. And if it's more than that, it would sink in water. For the last thing we have to learn about today are these things called diatomic elements. Here I have a periodic table and I've highlighted the diatomic elements in green. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. There are seven of them. An easy way to memorize them is to look at the periodic table and realize that there's a seven right here. And that seven identifies six of the seven diatomic elements. Diatomic elements are kind of unique. When I write a diatomic element out, it always has a subscript two because there's two atoms bonded together. They are never alone. These are the only seven that do this. The rest of the elements could be alone. I could have a single atom of magnesium. That's no big deal. However, oxygen does not exist as a single atom. Oxygen only exists as a diatomic. There are two oxygen atoms bonded together. So I need you to memorize hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. A couple ways to do it. One, look at the periodic table. There's a seven right over here. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And then you have to remember hydrogen. Hydrogen is a weird element. It's kind of separated. It's by itself for a good reason up there on the left. Um, but it's the diatomic. Another way you can think about it is heck no down the next row. So heck no. Heck starts with H. No. There's the word no. Down the next row. That's another way to memorize the seven diatomic elements. You can do whatever you want, but I will assure you, memorizing these diatomic elements will definitely help you for the entire year. Chemistry is one of these fun, you know, sciences that everything builds on it. So the things you're learning in this first unit, you will use in the last unit. You can't just skip a little bit around and figure out when you want to study and when you don't want to study. It's important the whole year. If you're mix, mixed up on unit one, unit two, unit three is gonna be even harder. It's not something you really recover on. You have to go back and really figure out unit one and two to have unit three make sense. Usually, I make my students memorize all of these elements on the periodic table. Here they are. I'm not gonna do that this year, but I would become familiar with these elements. We use these elements often enough that knowing the symbol and the name of that element will be very important. You don't have to memorize the atomic number or the atomic mass of those. What I'm looking for is you to realize, if you look at elements 1 to 20, we'll pick out, I don't know, this one right here. Aluminum is Al. Okay? That's what I'm looking for you to memorize. I need you to recognize that that two-letter or sometimes one-letter symbol stands for the element's name. When we talk about chemical reactions, you're gonna be so familiar with these elements at that point in time, but for now, I'd like you to at least glance at all these elements that I've listed here and kinda of understand them. These ones for sure, you need to memorize though, your diatomics. That's your first lecture, hopefully you had fun.